In 15th century England, as the Lancasters and Yorks fought each other in the Wars of the Roses, Anne Neville found her fate tied first to one side, then the other, then back again. This episode of Footnoting History is all about Anne and the world she lived in. Hey everyone, Christine here to talk to you about Anne Neville, most famously known as Queen Consort of England's King Richard III. Although the Wars of the Roses and Richard III are almost always hot topics in history, Anne remains largely a mystery. She appears infrequently in the historical record, and we don't have diaries or the like that would give us real in-depth detail about how she felt about things or what her motivations were. What I'm going to do here is give you Anne's biographical sketch, but with it we're also going to cover the complex conflict going on around her. My hope is that as you learn about her and the people and events that dominated her life, you'll end up, like me, wishing we knew so much more. Now, Anne's entire life took place during the period in English history known as the Wars of the Roses, so we're going to start with that. The Wars of the Roses were a giant family feud among the descendants of King Edward III, who had died back in the 1370s. Edward III had a lot of children, but for our purposes, we only need to know four of them. From oldest to youngest, they are Edward the Black Prince, Lionel, Duke of Clarence, John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster, and Edmund, Duke of York. These men all had descendants who would wear the crown of England. When Edward III died, his oldest son, the Black Prince, should have inherited the crown, but he was already dead. The Black Prince, however, left a son, and that son became King Richard II. In 1399, Richard II was overthrown by his cousin. This cousin, King Henry IV, was the son of Edward III's third mentioned son in my list before, John of Gaunt. He began the Lancastrian line, which came from that title that his father had of Duke of Lancaster. After that skirmish, things seemed okay for a while. Henry IV's son became Henry V, and then in 1422, Henry V passed away and his crown went to his infant son, who became King Henry VI. Henry VI's reign was troubled. By the time he entered his 30s in the 1450s, he started to experience mental health issues and periods of incapacitation. The first one of these was so severe that someone else had to come in and take over for a bit. That person was Richard, Duke of York. Be prepared, there are a lot of Richards and a lot of Edwards in this story, and a lot of Dukes, so just try and keep this all straight. Richard, Duke of York, was also a descendant of King Edward III. On his mom's side, he was descended from the second son, Lionel, Duke of Clarence, and on his dad's side, he was descended from the fourth son, Edmund, Duke of York. This meant that not only was he a relative of Henry VI, but he also had a pretty good claim to be king himself. Henry VI's wife, Margaret of Anjou, was particularly wary of the Duke of York, because she wanted to make sure that things were secure for her own family, and she didn't want to see Richard take away the throne from her husband, or, in the future, from their son Edward of Lancaster. Despite any political ambitions that he had, we have no evidence that Richard, Duke of York, meant any physical harm to Henry VI or his son. Still, the tension eventually exploded in battle. The Lancastrians were represented by a red rose, and the Yorks were represented by a white rose. That's why this period is called the Wars of the Roses. In the year after the first Clash of Swords, on June 11, 1456, a baby girl was born at Warwick Castle. That girl, our Anne, was the second daughter of Richard Neville and his wife Anne. They were the Earl and Countess of Warwick. Anne's elder sister, named Isabel, had been born about five years prior. Anne's family was smack in the middle of all of this action, and I imagine that all the information that I just gave you would have been embedded into her brain as she was growing up. Anne's family was even part of that extended family that was feuding. They were also descended from King Edward III, although they came from a branch that wasn't actually entitled to inherit the crown. 
As arguably the wealthiest and most important noble in England, Anne's father Richard had a lot of clout. He was a major player in the Wars of the Roses, and he even earned the nickname Kingmaker in the process. Of course, when Anne and Isabel were little, a lot of what was going on in terms of Yorks and Lancasters and battles wasn't something that directly involved them, but it did directly affect them. You see, Anne's father, Richard Neville, threw his support behind the Yorkist faction headed up by Richard the Duke of York. This could have meant bad things for the Neville family if the Yorks lost. But by the early 1460s, their future actually looked very bright. Why? Because Richard Neville had backed the winning horse. Although Richard, Duke of York, the leader of the Yorkist faction, had been killed in a battle, the Yorks still managed to defeat the Lancastrians largely with the help of Anne's father. Now, the Duke's son, Edward, took the crown as King Edward IV. This meant Anne's family was even more important than it had been before because her father was at the right hand of the king who he helped get the throne. In tandem with this, the Neville household expanded. It was common for high-ranking families to take in boys from other noble families and educate them in all the things they'd need to know as a nobleman in the 1400s, everything from you know history to battle tactics and horse riding and all that fun stuff. Among the several boys that came to live with Anne's family was none other than Edward IV's youngest brother Richard, Duke of Gloucester, who was four years Anne's senior and, spoiler alert, he would become her second husband and... King Richard III. But that was all a long way off. It was a testament to the position of the Neville family that the king's brother was entrusted to their care. He would stay with them until around 1468 when he turned 16 and started to take over his own estates. Although much of Anne and Isabel's time would have been spent learning the things expected of a noblewoman, you know, everything from, I don't know, dancing to household management and all the fun stuff in between there, they would have also no doubt socialized with the young men who were at the house. It is during this period that Anne first really appears in the records. In 1465, when Anne was about nine, her uncle George was enthroned as the Archbishop of York, and we know that Anne attended the celebration. There, she sat at a table that included both Isabel and Richard, Duke of Gloucester. It is a simple historical note, but given how infrequently Anne actually shows up in the records, it's one worth mentioning. See, the thing is that the information we do have about Anne is less about what she did or how she felt, and more about what her social position meant. While we may not know what she was thinking, we know that with no legitimate son to be the heir to their parents' expansive lands, Anne and her sister Isabel were co-heiresses. This made them incredibly desirable as wives, though they wouldn't get all of the land. The lands from the Neville family side could only go to a male descendant, so that meant neither Anne nor Isabel was going to get them. Somebody else, probably a male cousin, would. But the other lands, particularly those that came into the family through their mother's side, would go to the girls being split up between them. It was incredibly important then for them to make good matches. So while they were learning how to be proper ladies, their father was on the lookout for husbands for them that were high on the social ladder and as important as possible. The daughter first on his priority list was Isabel, because she was the elder of the two. Richard Neville set his eyes on a pretty big prize for Isabel's groom, George, Duke of Clarence, another brother of King Edward IV. Since Neville had been so helpful to Edward IV, you would think this would be a great reward, but Edward IV blocked the proposed union. Some have speculated that motivation behind this came from the result of his own marriage. Edward IV had angered his associates, including Anne's father, by secretly marrying an Englishwoman of unimpressive standing named Elizabeth Woodville instead of using his marriage to make an important foreign alliance. He possibly wanted to save George to marry off for an alliance in his stead. Whatever Edward's intentions were, this was a blow to both Richard Neville and George, who wanted to make it happen. Anne's father believed that he was more than due this marriage match for Isabel, and he added Edward's denial to his growing list of complaints about him. It already included the dislike of Edward IV's marriage and a dislike of the influence the new queen's upstart family had on the king. 
Eventually, relations between Richard Neville and Edward IV deteriorated to the point where Anne's father broke out in rebellion with George. As part of it, on July 12, 1469, George married Isabel in defiance of his brother. With her father in rebellion, and Isabel married to his co-conspirator, Anne's life was no doubt tense. Her father and George fought against the king and even had control of the government for a while. Then they reconciled with Edward IV only to break out in a second rebellion in 1470. To describe Anne's life at this time in one word, unstable. Now she was associated with rebels for the third time. The first time was when her father had backed the Yorks. That ended well because the Yorkists won and Edward IV became king. The second time was when he rebelled against Edward IV, and that was the time when Isabel married George. That also turned out okay because there was a reconciliation. But now her father was rebelling against Edward IV for the second time in as many years. How much back and forth could one family do before things blew up in their faces? This new rebellion had a more direct impact on Anne's life than the first two. Her family and George fled from England to the continent. Then her father left them to get help for his cause. Whether or not Anne knew what this would mean for her, I can't say. But either way, I imagine she would have been on edge. Richard Neville sought help from a very unlikely source. The exiled Lancastrians Margaret of Anjou and Henry VI. Yes, the very same people he had once helped to overthrow. He hoped that they could join together, get aid from the French king, and return to England and put Henry VI back on the throne. Without them, he didn't stand much chance of success. Margaret of Anjou and Richard Neville had absolutely no reason to trust each other. They'd been on opposite sides for quite some time and circled around one another. They eventually had the understanding that they were really joining forces because, you know, as they say, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. How then would they solidify their alliance? If you guess this is where Anne comes into things, you are correct. It was proposed that Anne Neville would marry Margaret and Henry's son, Edward of Lancaster. Now, this was a big deal. It really tied Anne to the Lancastrian cause, and it meant that Margaret and Henry could no longer have that option of marrying their only son and heir off in another alliance at a different point in time. It wasn't a card that the Lancastrians necessarily wanted to use, and certainly it upset some of their supporters that this enemy was getting such an amazing tie to the family but they agreed that it would happen. Anne would become the wife of the Lancastrian heir, and her father would help put Henry VI back on the throne. What stood between Anne and Edward and their marriage was the fact that they were related. They weren't related in any close way that you would think of as forbidden today. But by church rules at the time, since they shared a branch of the family tree within the prohibited range, they were technically not allowed to marry. This was a fairly common predicament in the period, as the relationships that were forbidden extended through several degrees of family ties. The way it was solved was that a petition was sent to the Pope, who either did or didn't say yes to the marriage, and he gave the couple a dispensation. That's a pass to marry despite the family relation impediments. While the whole dispensation situation was still being completed, Anne and Edward were officially betrothed. Then they waited for permission to marry. It took quite some time, so much time in fact that Anne's father had to leave with new forces to retake England before his daughter was officially married. I don't think he liked that very much. But he still did his job because by fall, Anne and her family and the Lancastrians had word that Neville was successful. He ran the Yorkists out of London and put Henry VI back on the throne. The dispensation had possibly arrived by now, but Anne and Edward were still only betrothed. When December rolled around, the French king, who, remember, had partially backed this rebellion, clearly had had enough of things. He took up the cause with the help of the church and said, Hey, Margaret, let's get these kids married now. So it was that in December of 1470, 14-year-old Anne Neville married 17-year-old Edward of Lancaster, the recently restored heir to the throne. We know nothing about the state of their marriage, but I'm going to give you an example of how this period is subject to a ton of diametrically opposed historical interpretations. One source I read for this episode declared that for sure 
they would have slept together immediately because Richard Neville would have wanted the marriage to be unquestionably legitimate and cemented by sharing the conjugal bed. The next source I read, literally the next source, this was back to back, that source said that they likely never slept together at all for the duration of their marriage. When we have no proof one way or the other, historians will often attempt to fill in the gaps. That's part of the job. But they won't always agree on how those gaps should be filled. Nevertheless, once they were married, it was decided that it was time to go back to England. After all, their side was the one in control now. But things didn't go as planned. The weather in early 1471 delayed their departure for weeks. And when they finally set sail, Anne's mother was on a different ship from Anne and the rest of the Lancastrians. It was mid-April by the time Anne and the others landed back in England. What should have been a glorious moment was exactly the opposite. They had barely put foot to land when they learned that George, Duke of Clarence, had abandoned the Lancastrians, returning to his brothers and taking Isabel with him. Henry VI was unseated again and back in Yorkist custody. To top it all off, that very same weekend, Richard Neville was killed in battle. His luck had run out, and everything crumbled to dust for the Lancastrians. When Anne's mother heard the news upon her separate landing in England, she quickly took herself into an abbey and hid in sanctuary. With her husband killed as a traitor, and one daughter married to each side of things, she had to look out for herself. This, however, meant Anne was left with the defeated Lancastrians alone. She stayed with her husband and mother-in-law as they gathered their wits and made their way west, where they hoped to regroup with more supporters. Only things got even worse. Edward IV's troops met with Lancastrian troops at Tewkesbury and soundly beat them, and with this defeat, Edward of Lancaster was killed. Shortly after, Henry VI was also put to death. Anne was a widow before her 15th birthday, after only about five months of marriage. More specifically, she was the widow and the daughter of a traitor. Things did not look good. Thankfully for Anne, Edward IV pardoned her and she was given over to the care of Isabel and George. This was a big win given how it could have gone. Anne's situation, though, remained precarious. From George's perspective, the best thing for Anne to do was nothing. If she remained single, he could get all the family lands on Isabel's behalf. If she were married, and especially if she remarried somebody powerful, then he could have a fight on his hands. In his dream world, Anne probably was convinced to enter a convent and give up all her rights as an heiress to George so he could take it all on Isabel's behalf. That didn't happen. In early 1472, Richard, Duke of Gloucester, who you might remember as the youngest brother of Edward IV and George, decided that he wanted to marry Anne. We already know that he knew Anne from when he spent his childhood living in the Neville home, but we have no idea what the two felt for each other. She certainly knew him more than she knew Edward of Lancaster before that wedding, but the actual details for why she agreed to this idea are lost to us. Could they have been in love? Maybe. Could it have been done out of mutual convenience so that she could get a life as something other than a widow and have Richard help her obtain her part of her inheritance? Also maybe. As a widow, she did have the power to say no, and she said yes. George did not like this match. He even went so far as to hide Anne from Richard, and some stories say that he did it by dressing her as a kitchen maid. Richard, by turn, found Anne and helped her enter sanctuary until everything was settled. Despite George's efforts to prevent it, eventually Richard won out and Anne was allowed to be with him, an arrangement approved by Edward IV. Much like when Anne married Edward of Lancaster, dispensations were required to move the barriers to their wedding caused by them being related through the church's eyes. We know that at least one dispensation was granted by the Pope, but that it did not cover all the impediments that needed to be given a pass. This could mean that absolution for the other impediments existed, but that we don't have it now, or that it never happened at all. You will find historians who argue both sides. I fall on the side of believing that some sort of dispensation or absolution did exist because it seems incredibly strange to me that they would not have sought to clear up all the possible issues instead of just part of them. If no dispensations were in existence currently, I might feel otherwise, and maybe I'd have wondered if they even bothered to check for one. But since one does exist, that's my opinion. As far as Richard and Anne were concerned, the marriage was on, and it occurred in either 1472 or early 1473. 
Regardless of the state of their dispensations, Anne and Richard lived like a completely normal couple, and everyone appears to have viewed them as such. They spent time together, they eventually had a son named Edward, and the validity of their marriage was not openly attacked. By being with Anne, Richard was able to advocate for her share of the family inheritance. George didn't like this either because it was exactly what he feared, and so the brothers entered into a squabble that had to be mediated by the government. The way it ended up was that the maternal side inheritance was split between the two sisters as if Anne and Isabel's mother, who was very much alive, was dead. Add to that the portion of the Neville inheritance, which you remember was supposed to go to the male heir, yeah, that went out the window when Neville died a traitor. So anyway, add that portion of the Neville inheritance that Richard and Anne got, and they were sitting on a nice amount of land centered in the north of England. In 1476, Anne had a personal loss when her sister Isabel died after giving birth to her final child, who also passed away. Then, George's wishy-washy loyalties caught up with him. He crossed Edward IV one time too many and was executed in 1478. Anne's life, meanwhile, continued. She and Richard were well-established and quite popular in the North. But then they got news in April of 1483 that Edward IV had passed away. This meant that Richard was the only York brother left and that Edward's young son was now going to be King Edward V. While Anne remained in the north, Richard rode down and collected Edward V from his mother's relatives, arresting some of them in the process. With Edward IV gone, no one had to listen to the Queen's relatives anymore, and some people wanted to keep them from taking control. Plus, as Edward's brother and most loyal sidekick, it was logical that Richard be the one to take charge of things, which he did and he was named Protector. What happened next is a series of events which people have especially huge opinions about, myself included. But Anne's role in it is unclear. About a month after Richard became Protector, Anne joined him in London. Their son remained in the North, but Anne had another child put into her care, George and Isabel's son. Edward IV's wife hid out in Sanctuary. Edward V was in Richard's custody, and eventually he was joined by his younger brother, also named Richard. Coronation for Edward V was planned. Then it was declared that new information came to light. Edward IV's marriage to his Queen Elizabeth was invalid because before they married, he had been contracted to marry another woman. As a result, Edward V and all of his siblings were now illegitimate, and Richard would become King Richard III. By the end of June, Richard had taken his seat as king, and on July 6th, Richard and Anne took part in a splendid coronation at Westminster Abbey. Anne is described as wearing her fair hair down with a golden circlet that was then replaced by a crown during the ceremony. The whole thing was a giant whirlwind. Following this, there was a royal progress through the country that culminated in Richard, now Richard III, and Anne being joined by their son Edward in the northern city of York. That was the place where they were most beloved, and it was where they chose to hold the ceremony where Edward was officially declared Prince of Wales, that is, the heir to the throne. This event was so fantastic. It included the knighting of several boys and royals wearing crowns and lots of eating and festivities that it was called like having a second coronation. It might have been the happiest period of Richard's short reign. Almost immediately after these events, trouble started brewing, as people who didn't approve of his taking the throne over Edward V popped up. Even though we know things like that Richard and Anne endowed some religious houses, and they held Christmas courts together, the threat of those who opposed either Yorkist rule in general, or Richard specifically taking the crown, was never fully quelled. In April of 1484, Richard and Anne's son Edward passed away. This absolutely crushed the couple. It also put extra pressure on them to have another child. After all, Richard's reign would become even more fragile without an heir. Although we believe Richard and Anne tried to have more children, it never occurred. And by the start of 1485, Anne was ill and doctors told Richard that he could no longer share a bed with her. On March 16, 1485, Anne passed away at the age of 28. Remarkably, on the same day, England experienced an eclipse of the sun. Before Anne's death, rumors spread that Richard wanted to divorce her, possibly even to marry his niece. He fervently denied this, and with good reason. 
Such a match would have been a terrible, incestuous, and also politically problematic decision. The other rumor was that Anne was being poisoned by Richard so he could secure a second wife and have more children. These were, of course, fueled by his detractors. Anne died from an illness that might have been tuberculosis. She was interred, purportedly with all the ceremony that you would expect to be done for a queen, in Westminster Abbey. No memorial was ever made for her in that time period, and we don't know if it was even supposed to be her final resting place. It's possible that Richard wanted them both buried either in York or in St. George's Chapel at Windsor Castle with Edward IV. Odds are that whatever Richard did intend to do for his wife, never got off the ground because he was killed only months later at the Battle of Bosworth. He was the last Plantagenet king and the last king of England to die in battle. He was succeeded by Henry Tudor, the newest head of the opposition, and one with a far weaker claim to the throne than either Richard or the dead Lancastrians. Anne Neville's story is a difficult one to piece together. She often appears one-dimensional, Someone who was there for many things, was tossed around a lot, and contributed little. That may or may not be true. The fact of the matter is, unless some new documents magically come to light, we're probably always going to have to discuss her in relation to the more famous people around her. We can't know which side she really favored in the Wars of the Roses, or how she felt about either of her husbands. We don't know what reason Richard gave her for taking the crown, or her opinions on that decision. Heck, Anne may have known the answer to one of the biggest unsolved mysteries in English history. What happened to Edward V and his brother after it was decided that Richard would become king? There are so many things, both about Anne herself and that Anne likely knew, that we do not. But man, I wish we did. Thank you for joining me for this week's tumultuous episode of Footnoting History. If you enjoyed this episode and you have a chance, please leave us a rating and review wherever you listen. They make us really happy. For more information about us and this episode, check out footnotinghistory.com. And remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.